Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Daily Crypto News. And today, I actually have a very special video for you guys on a very special person within the crypto space. I also think this video is going to be very informational and actually a one of a kind type of video that I really recommend you guys to watch all the way through so you don't miss out on any really, really cool stuff. So if you guys have no idea who I'm talking about yet and you haven't noticed from the title or the thumbnail or haven't revealed it, I'm talking about David Swartz. And I want you guys to comment down below if you've ever or never heard about David Swartz before. So just comment, yeah, I know him or no, I've never heard of him before. Yes, I've seen him come by once and I'm really interested to see what you guys know about him and if you have ever heard about him before. Because, uh, well, it's kind of important for this video. But for all of you that have no clue whatsoever, David Swartz, also known as Joel Katz, why? We'll see in a little second, is Ripple's trillion dollar man. At least, he's a very important figure over at Ripple because he is the chief technological officer, also known as CTO, over at Ripple, which is, of course, a very, very important position. Now, again, you can read in this article alone a ton about what makes him so special, but I guess the smallest amount of backstory to him, you can just read right here, the, the important parts, but he just had an interest for locks and all that type of stuff since he was very, very young, a very big interest into programming as well. And to just see here, in 1992, Swartz and his father, a doctor of internal medicine, co-founded a medical technology company that developed a non-invasive device for recording data about heart murmurs. The product didn't sell well, but demand for programmers rose during the dot-com era, and Swartz pursued a number of network-related programming positions. Meanwhile, he was getting interested in cryptography, and in 2001, he landed at a company in Santa Clara, California, called Webmaster Inc., where he helped to design an early cloud-based storage system, and during this decade, there he also consulted for the NSA, helping integrate the agency's network software with the existing security and public key infrastructure technology. In other words, Swartz was gaining a working knowledge of cryptography at a high level, and to quote, it was a fantastic experience, Swartz says. And if you're wondering why a lot of people call him Joel Katz, Along the way, Swartz developed an online persona, Joa Katz. The name was inspired by Stimpson J. Cat from the Ren and Stimpy show, a pseudonymously published by or his philosophical meanerings, but that doesn't all uh, matter at all. One of his very most important phrases is, democracy is vulnerable to a 51% attack. And uh, a lot more about that is going to be coming out as we check into some of his stuff right now. So, yes, David Schwartz was a pretty early adopter of cryptocurrency, and that can be seen from a lot of his talks over on the Bitcoin Talk Forum, which, again, we'll get to in a second. But before we get into most of that, if you guys are enjoying these daily crypto videos, support the channel by pressing the like button and subscribe. And also, a pay ID conference is going to be coming out tomorrow, and I just wanted you guys all to know that before I move on. First of all, there is a ton of speculation about what exactly David Swartz has done for XRP at the start. It's a very big question. How much of Ripple David Swartz had already designed about 30 years ago? And how much of Bitcoin was really David Swartz's idea? And also, if David Swartz is not actually Satoshi Nakamoto, there's even talks about that. Why is that so? Well, because about 30 years ago or so, here in 1988, David Swartz came up with a idea. And even a little bit later, he published the official patent. As can be seen here on you know, officially Google, Google Patents, David Swartz here started uh, an application in 1988 and publicated or publicized something in 1991. And as can be seen here, or if you download it, if you want to, You'll see some crazy ass stuff. So basically, all the way back then, 
he designed a Bitcoin. You know, he designed Bitcoin exactly what it is right now, but then in his own way. He just designed a decentralized, you know, blockchain type of a platform about, you know, about 20 years before it even came into existence, which is, of course, why many are speculating on whether or not he was really the designer of this real Bitcoin that we now know. Now, Joe Katz, here, what Crypto Jewel says is, Joe Katz worked with NSA and developed Bitcoin as a test run. He then left and created XRP as planned. He can never state the truth. And that's just a fun little reflection of what people expect of him or what people, you know, to what extent they go for his powers or to boast about his powers or just the theories that are coming out. And especially now that James Rule and some other guys over on Twitter shared this patent again, even though it's a, it's a little bit old and I think most people have seen it before. People are going around to speculate like crazy and the whole of Twitter is filled with it. And also, James Rule here posted the official um, Ripple Consensus white paper. So, Ripple's is white paper. And you can check that out as well. And of course, there's some similarities and some really interesting things you'll find in here, which you most likely never have seen before. And really, if you're ever wondering about a good book to read, just maybe check out like the Bitcoin white paper or this white paper. Because it's just, it, it might open your mind to a lot of things. And it's just eight pages, so it doesn't take long at all. And also, within this thread, there's a couple of people, like, for example, Mac Attack here, which post a lot of really interesting side information, for example, on even David Schwartz, Ripple, some history. Like, for example, he used to work for the NSA and had also attended the 2011 Bilderberg meeting while still with the NSA, to then later join on OpenCoin, Ripple's original name. Bilderberg is a group of the world elite. Search for it if you don't want to believe me. And yada, yada, yada. Some really crazy stuff he posted. A lot, a lot, a lot of theory. And um, it's a little bit too much to read for just one session. But it's some really cool stuff. So if you have some time, also check that out. I don't think you will regret it. Some really crazy stuff. Uh, moving a little bit further though, I want to check into a lot, <laughs> a lot of what David Swartz said over on the Bitcoin Talk forum. Because on this forum, bitcointalk.org, He's been for years. I believe he started in maybe 2011. I would say 2011 could definitely be so. And as you can see here, these are just pages of his posts. And with posts, I mean replies and all. And yes, it's 205 pages. And yes, that means that's about 4,000, 4,000, uh, let's see, 4,100 posts, which is... um which is a lot. And as you can also see, the first one came from June 21st, 2011. So that would mark a lot of years right now. <laughs> oh, damn, guys. Just thinking about how long ago that is already. It's almost a decade that we're talking about here that he's been on this forum. And uh, again, not, not, as, not as often he talks on it anymore. Ever since 2017 popped by. I guess June 2017, he kind of quit. Let's see, his last kind of, you know, on the roll was about here. On a Ripple discussion about the Ripple wallet. Yeah, and then afterwards, he, he stopped for a little month. And then another year came by before he, he, he talked again, ever. Which is uh, really interesting to see, in my opinion, how that all moved out. But let's take a little bit of a look at some of the things he has said. So, for example, here from 2012... Somebody said, the Federal Reserve wants to know what you think about quantitative easing 3. And again, you can check out all this stuff for yourself. Um, you, you, you just be able to find it all in, in his post history. Um, so yeah, if you want to find some cool stuff, just, just check in there. It's pretty damn interesting. And uh, yeah, the question was here, the Federal Reserve wants you to know about Q3. Some of the responses thus far, some stuff doesn't really matter. He said, for example... They launched the nukes and that helped a little. Then they tried carpet bombing the economy and that didn't work at all. The tank battalions went in and made a tiny bit of progress. The troops with machine guns didn't make a dent. QE3 is the rifleman. If that doesn't work, the Fed will pull out the bows and arrows. If that doesn't work, there's always sharpened sticks and rocks. And a little bit later, a lot of lives are on the line. The Fed is the ultimate too big to fail. And from all of his his, his thoughts and his posts, 
this is actually one that I found really, really interesting. Because, of course, we've often talked about Ripple's, uh, you know, plans are and how Ripple wants to work with banks and with these bigger financial institutions instead of replacing them. But it's also fun how a lot of crypto enthusiasts are thinking the Fed is going to fail and that Bitcoin was really created because the Fed possibly couldn't handle it all and possibly would, would have some bigger consequences on the general economy. But in my opinion, it, it is then quite interesting that he says that the, the Fed is too big to fail because that also takes away from some of the theories surrounding, you know, XRP thriving when the Fed fails because he thought, again, this is eight years ago, so take it with a grain of salt, that it's too big to fail. Even then already, eight years ago. I mean, right now, due to this conjunctural mess we're in, sort of, in my opinion, we're even at a way, way, way crazier point. So, theoretically speaking, the, the you know, the, the Fed would be even more secure ever than ever, right? Because, I mean, it lasted for another eight years since that point. But right. Another cool thing here was the question, what is the real risk of a 51% attack? And again, one of his key slurs is that a 51% attack you know, is, is going to destroy us. But he would say here, it would destroy Bitcoin. It would, however, be a huge boost to alternative cryptocurrencies that don't use computing power to solve the double spend problem. And again, that's a, that's, that's a pretty interesting twist quote to make once more you can you can interpret it how you want to but he clearly says it would destroy bitcoin and he said that in 2012 but he's still saying that right now a 51 percent attack would ruin us all but he also says it would however be a huge boost to altcoins that don't use computing power to solve double spend problem so basically he says it would however be a boost to for example coins like xrp possibly <laughs> to all those coins um which don't use proof of work because again he's been a very big guy of saying well proof of work is shit he said it tons of times before and he's still on that opinion right now so a couple of, of things that they taught back then as well was it could be quantum computers uh that that are going to be you know doing the 51 percent attack and asics but one fun thing i saw was that he said here uh quantum computer we're at five years minimum from anyone producing one tailor to mining, which is fun because right now we're eight years further and we're still not even close to, you know, a fraction of the quantum computer that could crack Bitcoin, which is interesting. Another one here was, let's see, it was what is holding you from investing tons of money into this? And it was a very big discussion about why you should or why you should not invest huge of money into Bitcoin. Again, coming all the way back from 2011 this time. June 2011, and it's a question of why are you not putting more into Bitcoin? And a lot of the, these guys says, well, I see Bitcoin as a currency, so would you buy a lot of US dollars to invest? No, they're using it as money. This guy says, I mine it. Another guy said, well, I bought it at a pretty high price of $26, which I find, <laughs> I find kind of interesting. I just laughed a little bit at that. Here said here. I unfortunately bought a little during the massive spike with $26 per Bitcoin, and it taught me a good lesson, <laughs> which was uh, pretty ironic if you you know know what we know now. But of course, a lot of talks were also about Mt. Gox, but here, David Schwartz replied on the second page, and he said, huh, as a reply to what is holding you from investing tons of money into this, he said, I don't think it makes sense to invest in mining or holding right now. For mining, the profitability doesn't, just doesn't seem to be there, which of course was an opinion uh, a lot at that time, but wasn't really true. And holding to take advantage of an expected deflation, as I've argued elsewhere, won't work. And again, very much not true, because, well, it could have been, uh, yeah, pretty damn good if you held for the last nine years. <laughs> would have been a ton of money even the last six years which would, would have made you a ton of money even the last two years you know if if you all held from 2011 to 2014 even that would have been a ton of money realistically speaking however the last part says holding to take advantage of an expected deflation i guess 
doesn't matter what you expect. Holding in general would have worked really well. But by the way, here it says democracy is vulnerable to 51% attack. That's his uh, key phrase from very often. Here's another cool thing, which was libertarian support of unions. It's just I found so many of his comments that I found really, really interesting or could relate to quite heavily. And yeah, I thought maybe you guys like this type of stuff too. If you do, this type of stuff is not for everybody. Just pause it for a split second. If you guys have seen it, take a little bit of a look at what the Taft-Hartley Act is. Yeah, you can move on with your day again if you read this one as well. It's, it's some crazy stuff, guys. It's, it's really fun to read through a lot of these 2011 discussions because it gives you some perspective of what the world is all about, you know, and what people are thinking and how that has grown onto us for the last couple of years. Another one here is Bitcoin businesses and developers. Let's get started. He says here, I'm an experienced developer and manager who specializes in emerging technologies. Most of my recent work has been in cloud storage and data security areas. I'm currently looking for new opportunities. And that's just kind of cool to see as well. And in 2011, he was kind of just a, you know, a good programmer. He's been working with some cloud storage and data security, but really wasn't, you know, working with or working as a, you know, top executive at one uh, at a billion dollar company or anything like that. He was just a normal, you know, for example, you know, just to compare it, a stay at home, for example, for example, for example, just a stay at home dad, for example, um, you know, just maybe maybe done a done school, you know, done with his PhD, for example, now looking for a little bit of a new endeavor, tried something, didn't really work out, is now just sitting at home with his degree and has a lot of knowledge, but doesn't really know what to do with all of that knowledge and all of his passion for things. You know, he's just a just a normal guy. And to see how that has grown in the last 10 years into such an influential master of a man is just really mind-boggling to me and really, really amazing. And also cool that he's been working with cloud storage for years and now fun how Ripple Cloud is coming about, right? All right, another one here is uh, on in 2017, so of course a lot later, but about Ripple. And the, the, the op said, Ripple is in major trouble. The exact question or thing was, so Ripple signed Japan SBI, which was a group of about 47 banks and created SBI Ripple Asia, which caused pump from 20 to 40 cents. But news just came out today that Japan jo SBI joined R3 and are creating their own coin. R3 has loads of banks on board and is like a universal bank consortium majority, which will be owned by the banks in it, unlike Ripple. They will use it to implement blockchain solutions to save them money. And I saw this coming a mile away. All these banks are investing in their own IOP, Ripple type of network, so they don't have to depend on a third party. Why depend on a third party when you can have your own and save even more? Whales are trying to maintain XRP value as some hold a lot, but they can't. But oh wait, but they can only keep buying so long because no one else is buying. Below are some competitors in the blockchain banking scene with more coming. R3, Quorum, Ripple, Axony, and Infosys. So, in the last years, I've never heard anybody talk about Quorum or Axony anymore. R3, Ripple, and Infosys, yes, we talk about a lot. But here it says, goodbye Swift and Ripple, hello R3 lol, get out before the house burns down, I've been saying this for a while now. There's no more good news left for Ripple, they were a shame at consensus, and now their group just ditched them. Greedy, centralized trash. Whew, that is a that is a very interesting opinion, right? And a lot of guys are going into this pretty damn heavy. And again, just just type it in into your browser or something like that. It's so cool to, to see this type of stuff in these discussions from a couple of years ago. And David Schwartz came into play, right? Let's quickly see what he had to say. He has his reply to, for example, I think he has more. Yeah. Here's a, here's a couple of replies, even three of them, actually. Four. Five. Wow. Wow, that's just, that's just crazy. <laughs> Six. Yeah, all right. So most likely he has even more. But the point is, there's so many questions and there's so many times that people pushed Ripple down or tried to explain why Ripple is shit 
or white centralized pieces of crap. And three, yeah, three years ago, he was already out there just explaining to everybody how they are wrong and he's right, <laughs> basically. And no, I'm just trying to say here that he's trying to help everybody out by explaining exactly what's going on, how it's all open, how it's all working. And I love that for for the fact that he's just, you know, giving out all this info. Nobody's asking him to really do it. You know, nobody's nobody's obliging him to do all of this stuff. And as I said before, he's been doing this since 2011, just in his free time, helping everybody out with all of their crypto and Bitcoin questions and whatnot, giving his opinion, giving his thoughts. That's that's just a true supporter of this move we're in. And um, as well, I just had one thing open, which I'll find in a second here. Oh, yeah. So just a little bit of a, of a, of a step back to you guys that are sometimes thinking R3 doesn't have the best interest in XRP. As the digital asset investor just also posted over on YouTube, you can see here R3 has the option for 5 billion XRP. It's been posted in a couple of articles before. And there's a, there was a big dispute going on. It got settled. Basically, we don't know the exact price they can buy XRP at, but we knew for a fact that they can buy a lot of XRP. And thus, it's also clear and I think kind of understood and accepted that um, they, they are allowed to buy some, um, some, some XRP when it gets there. And thus, they have the best interest in it also going up in, in price. And yeah, again, you could, you could check more into all these discussions here by just pausing possibly and reading it for yourself because I don't want to make this video four hours long, but I kind of should. You know, just check in more and more things because this stuff is just liquid gold. It's, or digital gold. I don't even know what to call it. It's, it's, it's amazing. You can find lots of places where I address honest concerns and acknowledging Ripple's weaknesses when responding to people who also honestly acknowledge the weakness of other cryptos. The history of Ripple is well known. This is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. And again, you're, you're, you're asking this question. Somebody said, for the XRP that Ripple has kept themselves, for what price was this XRP bought for? Or did it just mag magically allocate it to themselves by not paying a penny? The history of Ripple is well known. This is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. You're not honestly raising a concern. You're asking me to repeat a history lesson for you specifically. If you had an honest concern about the initial distribution, you would explain some way in which what happens concerns you, not ask me to repeat it to you. And that's because some people are wondering about all that type of stuff. Um, but again, you can read up on it more if you want to. It's, it's, it's all there. So yeah. Then, there's also other talks everywhere on the internet. For example, on Coil here, known David Schwartz, the chief cryptographer at Ripple, and David Schwartz is considered to be the soul behind Ripple, as said by Chris Larson, Ripple's executive chairman and founder or co-founder. And yes, it's it's often considered that David Schwartz is just the man behind the scenes arranging it all. Because I think I, I think really he's on on another level with knowledge of cryptocurrency and blockchain. He's on just such a new, huge level that it's, it's almost unimaginable what he knows it's just really completely insane i've never seen him unable to answer any questions that have been asked to him you know and when i watch those talks like the one i showed you guys earlier in my video today he's always just like oh thank you for that question and oh thank you if i were standing there and i know my way around crypto i would shit my pants for somebody to ask me one crazy strange cryptographic question right but since he wrote all those papers and you know, he's just been here for such a while. He knows it all. He knows decentralization. He knows everything. So bet your ass that in Ripple and the way they're building XRP, because of course, a lot of the XRP that is in escrow is designed for XRP ecosystem. We can know for a fact, 100% certainty that they have the best goals in mind. Because, well, who else could do it better than David Swartz? That's a big question I have really for you to answer. And here, more people are just wondering about exactly where the money is coming from, yada, yada, yada. He's always been answering that type of stuff. July 2017, still trying his best. Yeah, also on Twitter here, one of the things I saw was David Swartz, CTO of Ripple, who worked for the NSA and published an interesting patent in 1991, said, 
You think it's particularly hard for NSA or government of China to do a 51% attack on Bitcoin? And that's so fun to see because the last four days I've been asking you guys, you know, even earlier today, I made a video about Trump interested in, in, in crypto or in, in XRP and in Bitcoin and whatnot. What it would take for a government like the US to just decide to go all in and buy all the crypto. What would it take? Would it be possible? And all of that type of stuff I questioned. And a lot of you guys commented saying, yeah, it's most likely possible. And it's also David Swartz who commented years ago saying that it's not even hard for the government of the of US or of China to just go all in on Bitcoin and 51% attack it, basically rendering it useless. And all it take would be money. Um, and they can actually get a lot of the money back by shorting the Bitcoin price. Because, well, if they 51% attack it, everybody's going to be selling. Here's just some uh, XRP news that I found. More than 14 million deposits in the first week of listing on Coin Loan. Uh, what is this one? Interoperability and regulation, the key to DOT mass adoption. Wasn't that important. The patent, as we found out earlier, here is the patent in full glory. See what else we got. Oh, yeah. In the patent here, it actually says current SNE, SNE, if that's how you pronounce it. One of them is Wintershell Dea Deutschland AG. And I was just wondering exactly how that works. Because the SNE, I know it doesn't have to be the inventor of the patent. But how does it come to be such a company like this? How does that work out? If you guys know, let me know in the comment section down below. Again, Mac Attack coming in with some facts, which is pretty cool. He posted a lot of this type of stuff, which again, I recommend you guys to read. And last but not least, I had the Ripple protocol open once more. All right, so that would then definitely conclude the video of today. Hopefully you all enjoyed it. Hopefully you learned something new about David Schwartz and basically just why I believe and put all my faith into Ripple because this guy is at the top of it, which I know for a fact has more knowledge about crypto than I ever will in four lifetimes, even if I try my best to study it every single day. And thus, I'm not worried. I know for a fact that what they're making here is going to be good, is going to be decentralized, and will sure as hell be good for the world. So guys, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all again in another crypto video. Don't forget to press the like button and subscribe. Take care, everybody, and have a very, very nice.